21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. Who's dead? Who? She was killed. Ah. Where is it? West? 88 East what? East 70th? Who is this calling? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. Just stay right where you are. The officers will be there right away. Yes, right away. They'll take care of it. Yes, right away. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their persons, their homes, and their property is my job. My job and the job of the 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. What makes a city? Not buildings, not subways, not business. People make a city. From dawn to midnight, from midnight to dawn, people will pour their lives together and stir up the city, where even love can lead to death. I was working my 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. tour. When I arrived at the station house, I signed the blotter and read over reports and communications that had accumulated since I went off duty 24 hours previously. Sharply at eight, I walked into the muster room and turned out the platoon for the day tour. As the men marched out the door to take over their posts, Sergeant Burns, the patrol sergeant, indicated he wanted to see me. I came around from behind the desk where Lieutenant Gorman was on duty as desk officer and Sergeant Klein on the boxes and crossed to my office. Sergeant Burns was waiting inside. Morning, Captain. Hello, Sergeant. Well, what is it? Baldy went sick this morning, Captain. Yes, I noticed it on the roll call. What about it? Well, he's been riding in sector car two with Warren. Yes, I know it. Listen, what's this UF-61 here? It says a radio stolen from a parked car. What kind of radio? And where was the car parked? I can't sign a report like that and send it on to division. Was that on my tour, Captain? Yesterday, yes. Don't you look these things over before they're written up? How did he get by you? Whose is it? Parker. Check his memorandum book and see if he's got the facts himself. If he hasn't, get on his tail. Yes, sir. All right. What about Bolney? Well, he's been riding as a recorder in sector car two with Warren. Yes. I noticed they hadn't been getting along so well together, always crapping about who's going to take what pension so forth. No complaints to me, but I could see this had been going on. Mm. I warned them that I'd split them up if they didn't knock off. Well, it kept going on. After the tour yesterday, I told them I was going to put them both on fixed posts today. And Bolney went sick this morning? Yes, sir. Well, how about Warren? He's swinging. You think Bolney's malingering? He looked all right yesterday afternoon, Captain. Did he? Yes, sir. Sergeant Klein. Sergeant, get me the reserve surgeon, will you? Yes, sir. Captain, looks like we've got a bad homicide. Where? The boy's hopping, Captain. I got four or five calls. All right, I'll be out. Says it looks like we've got a bad homicide. Where's that? I don't know. The board's jammed up. That's right. It's 87. That's all we know about it. Call came through CB. I caught it on the air. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Captain. That's all right. What have we got? It came over the air as a signal 32 ambulance responding. I rang down to CB and they told me a woman called in, the maid, apparently. She got to work this morning and found the lady's body. Homicide for sure? She was a little hysterical. That's what they gathered. No name? No, sir, not yet. Well, did you notify the detectives? Yes, sir, just now. That's the press again. They've been burning in here since the call was put out. 88 East 70th. That's a good address. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. Let's take a ride over there, Molly. Yes, sir. Look, you know as much about it as we do. Paul didn't even come through here. The detectives are just now on the way. I just know I about gave it. instructions to the desk officer to reach Who's the surgeon on reserve by telephone with a request to visit yeah, the home yeah. of Patrolman Bolney, who reported sick yeah, under circumstances which indicated he might be attempting to evade disagreeable duty. Then with Sergeant oh, Burns, I drove to 88 East 70th Street, the scene of the reported homicide. The house was a four-story white stone mansion built early in the century and converted within the last ten years to an apartment building, one apartment on each floor. One of the sector men had been posted at the street door to keep the curious out of the entrance hall. He told us the occurrence did, in fact, appear to be homicide. We went inside and took the small self-service elevator to the third floor. 
The door to the apartment was standing wide open. The place was magnificently furnished. There were thick wall-to-wall carpets. I went over to talk to the maid who sat on the living room couch. She still wore the hat she had on when she arrived at work. Hold me, Peter. I'm Captain Kennelly. She was so beautiful, so beautiful. To walk in the bedroom like that and find her. Sprawled out. Cold. Did you call the police? Yes, sir. I called the police. When I first opened the door of the apartment, I knew there was something the matter. I knew it. The television was on, newspapers, grasses were all over the front room. Ashtrays full up. Miss Edith never left anything like that. Uh, looks pretty straightened up in here now. Yes, sir. I turned off the television and picked up a little. Then I walked back to the kitchen. That's when I saw it. The minute I saw it, I knew it. Laying on the floor there in the bedroom, just stretched out. That yellow hair she had all turned everywhere. She always had it so neat. So neat, mister. What's your name? My name? Yes. Doris. Doris Ramsey. Ramsey? No, sir. With an O. My family spell it with an O. Mm. Head bashed in like that. Who could do something like that to Miss Edith? She never hurt anybody in the world. Never hurt anybody in the world. So kind and nice. Where do you live, Doris? 134th Street. Where on 134th Street? 406 West. Poor Miss Edith. Poor sweet little thing. Excuse me, Captain. Never hurt yes. nobody. Nobody. Oh, well, then you better keep them out in the car. The fewer people walking around in here, the better. Yes, sir. I'll tell them. Her name was uh, Edith Camden? Yes. Edith Camden. Yes. Mm-hmm. Does she have any family? No, sir. No family. At least not in New York. She comes from Texas. She's got brothers in Texas, too, I think. Poor, sweet little girl. So sweet. She must have been pretty well off to live in an apartment like this. Did she live here alone? Yes, sir. All alone. She wasn't married? No, sir. Was she ever married? No, sir. Not that she told me. Did she go to business? What do you mean? Well, I mean, did she have a job or anything like that? Oh, no, sir. Not Miss either. Well, what did she do? You had a friend, Captain. Oh. Hello, Captain. Oh, hello, man. Doris, this is Lieutenant King. He's in charge of the detectives who take over this case. Yes, sir. You tell him everything he wants to know. Yes, sir. Poor Miss Edith. I don't know what I'm going to do without her. I couldn't work for nobody else. Nobody else. Where is it, Captain, in there? Yeah. Let's take a look. You sit here, Doris, all right? Yes, sir. It's all right. I'm not going, no, please. You think the rent is on this place, Captain? Four or five hundred a month? Yeah, something like that, I guess. Pretty steep. Not if someone else pays it. In here, man. Mm. Pretty dress she was wearing. Not torn. She wasn't struggling with anyone. No, it doesn't appear that way. That's what she was hit with, I guess. What is it, do you think? I don't know. It looks like a fire tool to me. Oh. Who was she? What did she do, do you know? She didn't do anything. She had a friend. No. Oh. Well, the tabloids are going to have a field day with this one. Made to order for them. It sure is. There's all the elements. A mystery, a blonde, and Park Avenue. Yes, sir. Too bad she's not around to read about it. The call had come in at six minutes after 8 a.m. It was now 8.25. At the moment, little more was known about the case than what we could see. A striking blonde named Edith Campton was dead from a blow across the base of the skull in the bedroom of her apartment just off Park Avenue. Within minutes, the apartment began to fill up with specialists and experts. Detectives from the Manhattan East Homicide Squad arrived to work with detectives from the 21st Squad. As required, the chief medical examiner and the New York County District Attorney were notified. Latent fingerprint experts and a photographer from the police laboratory were summoned. Superior officers of the detective division who had been notified in accordance with the manual of procedure began to arrive on the scene. At ten minutes before nine, when I left the apartment, the investigation was well underway. I instructed Sergeant Burns to have his men resume patrol as soon as possible. On the street, a considerable crowd had gathered. The press was out in force. 
I suggested they direct their questions to the chief of detectives, the commander of the Manhattan East Homicide Squad, and the district attorney's office. At five minutes after nine o'clock, I returned to the precinct house. Hello, Captain. Sergeant? Excuse me, this board has been humming. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. Chief who? Oh, he's not here. I haven't seen him. Just a second. Captain, it's the borough commander's office. Did you see Deputy Chief Pope this morning? He was over at the scene of that homicide. Hello. He was over at the scene of that homicide we had. Is he still there, Captain? He was there when I left. He was there when Captain Kennelly left. All right, call his office. I'll tell him, yeah. Hold it, Captain. Hopping. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. Listen, Coley. Uh, somebody called in here and said there was a bus stop stanchion in the second floor hall of 622 E64. Well, how should I know? Some drunk must have carried it in there during the night. Walk over there and take a look. Yeah. All right. How should I know how the stanchion got my call? Did you hear from the surgeon on reserve, Sergeant? No, sir, not yet. How does this homicide look? Mm-hmm. Pretty heavy, Sergeant. Well, that's all we need around here now. Another Lonergan case. What else is doing, Sergeant? A car struck a pedestrian on Lexington Avenue in 60th. Bad? A man got up and walked away from it. Then he decided his back hurt and he went into Metropolitan. Did we hold the driver? No, sir. The man walked out from between two parked cars right into the side of the automobile. Just given a summons to pull the brakes. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. The detectives are all out. Can I help you? Well, that's what the detectives are all out on, that homicide. No, I don't know anything more about it. Okay. You're welcome. Some guy from the general. Uh, you'll have that all day, Sergeant. You might as well be ready for it. I know. What's it look like, Captain? What do you mean? Any idea who killed him? I just started looking into it when I left. Uh, how was she killed? With a fire tool, apparently. Listen, what time have you got Farrell and Eisman down for their meals? Uh, 12.30 to 1 for Eisman, 1 to 1.30 for Farrell. Mm, well, switch them around because I want the car at 1 to take me downtown to division. Yes, sir. Let Eisman take his meal at 1 and put him on post until Farrell gets back with the car. She was supposed to be a pretty good-looking head, Captain. Yeah, I imagine she was. And one of those fellows in the press told me she won a beauty contest in Texas seven or eight years ago. That's how she first happened to come to New York. Judges picked her unanimously. Texas Venus, they call her. Did they? I wonder what the judges would have called her if they'd seen her this morning. Homicide is, of course, the most serious crime on the books. But it's not very often that detectives are called upon to deal with a murder mystery typical of detective fiction in which the guilty party must be singled out from among a number of known suspects. Nearly all homicides fall into two other categories. Either there are crimes committed in the heat of passion with the killer readily identifiable and easily apprehended, perhaps within minutes after the act, or there are felony murders committed during the course of robbery, burglary, or rape, in which case the killer seldom had any previous connection with the victim. In the case at hand, there was an element of mystery. At 20 minutes past 10 a.m., I had finished reading and signing reports and communications. <clears throat> Captain Kennelly. Sergeant Klein, Captain. The surgeon on reserve is ringing in. Dr. Van Teller? Oh, all right. Hold on, Captain. Captain Kennelly. Hello, Captain. Dr. Van Teller, Chief Surgeon's Office. Yes, Doctor. I called at the home of Patrolman Bonnie. He was in bed. Well, did you examine him? Did he appear to be malingering? Well, he complained of a pain in his stomach. I see. Well, if anyone can complain of a pain in the stomach, whether they got it or not. But a temperature of 101 and a half is a little bit difficult to manufacture. He's sick, all right. Oh, uh, well, what's the matter with him, Doctor? Well, it looks like this virus is coming around. That's what I say it is. Well, how long do you think he'll be out? A couple of days, that's all. All right, Doctor, thank you. All right, Captain. Goodbye. Much obliged. Captain Kennelly. Sergeant Klein on the TS, Captain. Joe Wigan of the news is out here. He wants to see you. Oh, about what? About what, Joe? Oh, oh. Uh, about the homicide, Captain. Well, tell him I don't know anything about that. He ought to talk to the detectives. Yes. Uh, Captain says he doesn't know anything about it, Joe. Talk to the detectives. Oh, just a second. He wants to see you anyway, Captain. All right. Tell him to come on in. Yes. Come on in, Joe. Oh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Who's on post number six? Come in. Uh, when he rings in, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Hello, Captain. Yeah, leave the door open, Joe. When he rings in, tell him I've got a written complaint from a citizen about a peddler selling fruits and vegetables from a wagon over there. 
Tell him if he runs across that peddler to check and see if his license is okay. Yeah. Oh, sit down, Tom. Big doings up here today, Captain. Well, I can't tell you anything about it, Joe. I don't know anything. I was only there for a few minutes this morning. What did the apartment look like upstairs? Plush? Yeah, it was plush, if you want to call it that. But you better talk to Lieutenant King or the Chief of Detectives or the Homicide Captain. They've got it all over there. We don't know anything here. What, Captain, I got tired of waiting out on the street. I saw all the big brass going in and none of them coming out. You get tired of standing first on one foot and then the other. What's the deal? Who did her run? Joe, I told you, I don't know anything. You're the captain of the precinct, aren't you? Well, I still don't know anything. What is this, Frank? The Wilhelm Strasser, somebody's got to know something. Now, be patient, Joe. You've got a morning paper. You've got all day to get your story. You'll get it. I'm embarrassed to call my city editor. Well, don't be embarrassed, Joe. He understands. You never know how to talk to him. Get your story out there, Joe. The chief of detectives. Excuse me, Captain. Frank, the last. The muster room was alive with activity. Lieutenant Matt King of the 21st Detective Squad had walked in the door with the chief of detectives and the acting captain in command of the Manhattan East Homicide Squad. Close on their heels were reporters from all of the seven daily papers with general circulation in New York, the Associated Press, and a newsman from CBS Radio. Lurking on all sides were photographers from most of the papers and motion picture cameramen. It was apparent that these top officers had avoided talking to the press at the scene of the homicide, but now they were cornered. I walked out into the muster room where the questions were being fired at a rapid rate. Think that the medical examiner fixed the time of death? Not yet, not definitely. Sometime during the night. I'm sure there is quite a double line. All right, all right, take it easy. Just a second. Why yet? Listen, Chief, we don't have anything for a story yet. Nothing. Give us a break, will you? Well, I'll tell you what we do, boys. There's some things we know we can't tell you yet. Give us a couple of minutes to decide what we can tell you, and you'll have a start. Okay? Okay, Use the captain's office. Use us. Coming through, then. Hello, Frank. Chief. Rough deal, huh? Rough. Wicked. Go ahead. Help yourself. Mm. Come here, Frank. Frank. Listen, give us a break, will you? Yeah, close that door. Uh, they'll find a way, those guys. How are you been, Frank? Okay, fine. How's Ellen? Good. I'll give him my best. Well, I guess I'll have to tell those boys something, Matt. They're entitled to their story. Yes, sir, but I'd like to keep quiet about the boyfriend for a while. I don't think there's any point putting him into it yet, Chief. No, neither do I. We can tell them that Edith Camden isn't a real name. She's just been using it since she came to New York. Yes, sir. What else? Well, she worked as a model. Not a cover girl? No, sir, for a fashion house. Been in a store, but I think they know that. Uh, how about suspects? Well, who, Chief? Well, supposing I say there's four or five people we want to talk to, but that we can't divulge any names at this point. Yes, sir, that'd be good. You might want to mention her address and phone book, that we're checking every one of her friends. No, I'd better say acquaintances. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, that address and phone book ought to make them happy. Always does. Thirty detectives assigned to the case. How's that? Fine. They want to know if there was any evidence of her being killed by a burglar or someone who entered the apartment with criminal intent. I think you can tell them that the place wasn't broken into, Chief. Okay. Want them to let them talk to the maid, Matt? I think all they'll want is pictures of her. We can go that far. All right. Guess that about does it. Frank, let's get together some night, huh? Oh, I'd be glad to, Chief. I'll tell Mary to call Ellen and set it up, okay? Fine. Okay, Matt. And show me to the wolves. Yes, sir. All right, fellas. Give him a chance. Give him a chance. Chief, one question first. My desk wants to get a photographer into her apartment. When can we do that? Uh, sometime early this afternoon, just as soon as the technicians from the police laboratory get finished. What time? What time, Matt? 1.30 at the latest. Quiet. Quiet. All right, boys, this is the story. We've got 30 men on the job. At this moment, we have no more idea than you do who the killer is. However, there are four or five people with whom we want to talk about this. Now, in addition to that, Miss Camden had a telephone and address book. A little black book? Uh, what color is it, Matt? Baby blue leather. <laughs> hey, boy. <laughs> now, in addition to the four or five, we'll be in touch with every person listed in her phone book in order to get some idea of her movement yesterday and last night. As I told you before, the ME's office has not yet reported... So the press had their the story. Time death. All that could but be divulged without hindrance to the investigation was given to them. In a few minutes, the reporters hurried out of the precinct house to find telephones. The chief of detectives and the acting captain of the homicide squad went upstairs to the 21st squad with Lieutenant King. Within an hour, both had left the precinct house. Now started the real work of the homicide investigation. Detectives of the homicide squad teamed off into pairs with men of the 21st squad to work as partners until the crime was cleared. 
At 1.30, the car came by the station house to take me to 6th Division Headquarters, 160 East 35th Street, for a conference with the division commanders. While I was out of the precinct, a well-dressed graying man in his late 40s was brought in by Detectives Whitey Howard of the 21st Squad and Edward McInerney of the Manhattan East Homicide Squad. They took him directly upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad. This way, Mr. Newfield. Yes. You don't think it will take long, do you? I wouldn't know about that, sir. Come in. Lieutenant, we got Mr. Newfield here. Oh, good. Come in, Mr. Newfield. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a seat. Thank you. This was some shock. You have no idea what a shock. When these officers told me, it's like a... like a bolt of lightning. Cigarette, Mr. Newfield? Oh, much obliged. Ed? Whitey? Thanks, Lieutenant. Thank you. I'm Lieutenant King. How do you do? You know what this is all about, don't you, Mr. Newfield? Yes, I suppose so. Is Walter Newfield your full name, sir? Walter Crane Newfield. And where do you live? I have a home in Westchester. Where in Westchester? Winslow Park. Your business in New York? That's right. What is your business, Mr. Newfield? I'm a paper broker. What is that? I act as broker for mills in uh, selling paper to printers and publishers. I see. Do you commute to New York every day? Every weekday, yes. Married, Mr. Newfield? Yes. For how long? Nineteen years. Any children? Two. Two girls in high school, 15 and 17. You were acquainted with Miss Camden? Yes. For how long? Oh, I don't know, three, three and a half years, I suppose. Um, what can I do with this? I really don't feel like smoking. No. Oh. How well acquainted, Mr. Newfield? Oh, quite well. Did you see her frequently? Yes. How frequently? Two, three times a week. Ever off now? Yes, sometimes. In her apartment? Yes, there, and uh, we'd go out to the theater and club together. Was that her apartment, Mr. Newfield? She lived there, yes. I know she lived there, but who paid the rent? Well, I imagine she did. Who gave her the money? I don't suppose there's any use of denying the fact that Edith and I were very close. My wife and I hadn't gotten along for years. Someday I hope to marry Edith. That's the way it is. I couldn't help it. A man needs some sort of life. You paid the rent? Yes. When did you last see her, Mr. Newfield? The night before last. You didn't see her yesterday? No. The last night? No. Were you in New York yesterday? Yes. Where? I was at my office until 5.15. And then? I went to Grand Central, took the 534 home. To Winslow Park? That's right. Was your wife at your home in Winslow Park? No. Where was she? She and the girls are in Cape Cod for a month. Was anyone at your house in Winslow Park beside you? No, I was all alone. Did you see anyone you knew on the train? Why, well, I think so, Lieutenant, yes. Who? Well, I don't recall at the moment. I have to think about that. Sure, you go ahead. Think about it, Mr. Newfield. Lieutenant, I know this can't help coming out. This whole thing is bound to get in the papers. I don't care about myself or what anybody says about me, but those two young girls of mine, this is going to be terrible on them, just terrible. It'll be worse on them, Mr. Newfield, if you continue to tell us lies. Well, I haven't told you any lies. You just said you didn't see Miss Camden last night. That's a lie, isn't it? No, it isn't. You said you were home in Winslow Park last night. That's also a lie. You know you never left New York? How about the truth, Mr. Newfield? How about the truth? Well, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know what to do. I haven't had time to think. I have nothing in the world but those two girls. Please think of them. That was your job, Mr. Newfield. I've got mine. The interrogation of Walter Crane Newfield continued. So did my conference at division headquarters. It finally broke up at 3 p.m. Patrolman Farrell drove me uptown to the 21st. I instructed him to pick up his partner and resume patrol. He drove away, and I walked up the steps and into the muster room. Greenberg, 
first precinct, Sergeant Klein. All right, 17. Hello, Captain. What's doing, Sergeant? There's nothing like this morning, sir. Oh, that's good. Where's Lieutenant Gorman? I'm uh, filling in for him, Captain. The DA's office called for him to come down in a hurry. Yeah? A burglary case went to bat this afternoon, which he made the arrest when he was a sergeant in the 64th last winter. Well, this is a fine time to let us know, isn't it? Well, the boy was going to take a plea, but he decided to stand trial until last minute. Oh. All right. Stand right up to the desk there, would you please? Yeah. Okay, Whitey, book him in. Yes, sir. Just a second. Hello, man. Captain. Walter Train Newfield. Matt? Yes, Captain. What's this? That homicide. Middle name is C-R-A-N-E. Train. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Mm, that's fast work. He got twisted up in his own lives. N-U-F-F-I-E-L-D. How did it happen? When he finally told us, he said she was going to break it off. She had a guy she wanted to marry. Age? 47. He was so enraged, he picked up a fire iron and hit her over the head. What's the charge? Murder first. Why'd he do it? What'd he say? He said he killed her because he loved her. Well, if you've got to kill somebody... That's as good a reason as any. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Klein. Stole your what? Your safe. Where is it? And so it goes around the well, clock like through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or. The brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Lawson Zerbe, Wendell Holmes, George Petrie, Joseph Julian, Frank Reddick, Eric Dressler, and Rosetta Lenoir. Written and directed by Stanley Ness. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking.